Welcome to Give It A Nudge. Today we have an old guest returning in a new format, in a new role, in a new world. Jess, welcome back. Thanks, Steve. It's Great been to see you. Three years since you came on the first time? Yeah, I think that would be about right. And you're now at KPMG Futures. Yes, I am. Back then, you'd probably just come out the, out the program, which is right next door to the studio. Yep. And you had your business remote social. Yep. So, wow, big changes. It's definitely been quite a journey. It has yep. been a journey. I mean, obviously, we've spoken a lot during that time, but it's been a fascinating journey. We'll get into that in a little bit. But before we do that, um, just tell us a little bit about your role at KPMG Futures, just, just to give it a frame up for everyone who's watching as to what you actually do right now. Yeah, sure. So KPMG Futures is essentially the innovation division for the firm. Yeah. Um, we are working very closely within Futures on what the future of the firm looks like. Obviously, technology is changing a pace and that's having massive impacts on every industry, including consulting. Yeah. Um, what's been so interesting to me having not worked in a big organisation and certainly not in a consulting organisation before now, is the breadth and depth of the client relationships they have. Mm -hmm. And so that technology shift is obviously impacting all of our clients as well. Yeah. Within Futures, our role is to imagine what the future looks like. And my role specifically is in venture partnering, which is essentially early stage um, investing in some cases, yep. but in every case, deep strategic partnerships with early stage businesses and really with a focus on very innovative businesses. So even though it is a role within a corporate, um, within a big partnership, I'd say it's not a very sort of big four role that I'm sitting in because I'm working <laughs> every day with founders, um, working on innovations, talking to them about how to grow their businesses and really developing those deep strategic partnerships as well as building investment cases where that's appropriate. So you know I think you're probably the first person we've had on from a corporate I don't know how I feel about yeah. it. <laughs> it's only because yeah. of our history. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, KPMG particularly, and you know, I guess Combank, and, and that's probably about it really, have sort of held on to their early stage venture futures, high growth, all those different, you know, X15 businesses and kept them going. Whereas a lot of those other corporates, when they were on trend, they all did it. Most of them seem to have pitted off. Yeah. Um, why do you think KPMG sort of stuck stuck in there with it when so many others haven't? I mean, I think innovation is really critical to creating the business that you want to evolve into. And I think there's definitely a very strong acknowledgement about that within the firm, that we have to be constantly pushing the boundaries of what we're doing in order to stay relevant and continue to be able to offer the services that our clients would expect in the future. So, yeah. Um, I mean, for me, as you say, it's it's quite atypical at my stage of career, having had such a diverse background, diverse career to date, to make the move from early stage back into such a large organisation. And um, yeah, I, 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 there are not very many people who run a venture back to business and no. then go into working for a big organisation. I think for me, the thing that really appealed to me is that there are so many benefits when that's done well mm -hmm. of um, building really strong relationships between early stage businesses and large businesses that have really deep client networks and ability to be able to deliver clients and, and, um, and work on co-innovation that is really commercially viable and so I, I really saw I'd seen it from the startup side yep. and the vision that they had to be able to bring that innovation to KPMG clients was really um, interesting to me and having been a founder and felt that pain myself I saw a lot of opportunity to do it better than many other organizations have and I actually think having the founder background has been a really strong differentiator for me. I have really strong founder empathy. Mm -hmm. I you know, know what it's like working <laughs> in and running an early stage business. Um, and many times when you've come up through corporate or through large organizations, you just have never worked in that sort of no, environment. And so you <clears throat> don't have that lens. And so that's something that I think you know, for KPMG, I think I would have been quite an atypical hire, actually, with my background. Um, but I think it's there's a, definitely a really strong commitment to bring different perspectives around the table. And I definitely am constantly bringing the founder side to the conversations about how we look at things. And I think that's made us a much stronger team, actually. It's certainly been to benefit to 
the startups that we're working with and have great relationships with the founders. And I was chatting to one of the founders yesterday and he was like, it's not that typical that we meet people in organisations who just want to kind of push through walls to make things happen. And I think that's the early stage mindset, yep. transplanting that back into a bigger organisation. I think it's also made me more well-rounded, you know, regardless of where I end up, you know, five or 10 years from now. We shall see. Yeah, I think it's actually made me quite well-rounded in a way that I may not have been before because I hadn't had such big org experience. And it's not just venture back. Right? You've had other businesses that you'd run as well that were more yep. sort of your traditional bootstrap businesses, yep. right? Yeah. So you've really kind of seen it from, from all sorts of areas. Yeah. Now, I remember when you finished up at Remote Social and I remember you looking for a job because we, we spoke about it. Yeah. I never actually asked you, how did you end up? Because that wasn't, you didn't come to me saying, hey, I really want to work for a big four consulting firm. Yeah. So how did you end up there? What, how did that occur? What, what sort of, how did you end up in KPMG's wonderful sort of futuristic department? And how did they end up looking at someone like you, which they traditionally wouldn't have maybe a few years back? Yeah, so I think it was... I mean, the founder journey is a really interesting one, as you well know, from all your various <laughs> businesses. And, and you know, it was a hard for me, the decision to leave remote social. You know, we'd raised money. Yep. I had a really strong conviction in what we were building, you know, great relationships with the team, great relationships with fantastic investors that we brought onto the cap table. Um, ultimately, you know, we had quite a strong sort of divergence of opinion on the team about what we were building and, and that made it quite difficult to execute. And, and so it, it really felt like even though I didn't want to leave, it was the best thing for the business and the investors for me to do that. Because there were three of you, right? Three, three founders. Is, three is an interesting number. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, they always talk about two being the ultimate number. I'm kind of a fan of one right now. Yeah. Um, have yeah. my own experiences with two. Never yeah. been in a three. I've seen four or fives as well. But yeah, um, yeah what was that like? Because you don't see a lot of threes anymore. Yeah, I think, you know, it worked really well for, for quite a long time. And, you know, we, we all had great respect for each other as people and as individuals. And we brought really differentiated skill sets, which I think is really important in an early stage business if, if it can work. The original idea for remote social was something that had been Mike's, and um, and he, you know, he remained really committed to his vision, and you know, ultimately we just had sort of differences of opinion, and yeah. and in an early stage business, you really can't continue to execute unless you have a sort of shared vision, no. and so you know that was, I, I guess, back to your question about how did I end up at KPMG? It was a it was a departure that I probably hadn't anticipated. Um, you know, it's not like I'd been planning it for a year no. or anything. And so I really found myself at an interesting point of thinking, I don't want to lurch straight back into starting something else up because I want to make sure that I've got my full energy if I launch another business. Yep. And looking around at the different options, I, I interviewed for a couple of roles in venture that didn't work out That's for right. one reason or another. And then when I saw this role, I thought the mandate sounded really interesting. And, and I, I actually saw the role advertised on LinkedIn and, and reached out to them to, for a bit more of a chat about the role and, and what their vision was. And I think it was that, how can you apply the founder perspective in order for more of that sort of win-win uh, sort of relationship building and deal building and, and rather than necessarily uh, only having, you know, both sides so far apart, what can you do to meet in the middle and for both sides to understand each other a lot more than I think they traditionally have in some of those other yeah. types of big organisation, early startup relationships. And, and as a secret to all the viewers out there, what's it like? What's it actually like working in an organisation where you have resources? And I know there's a certain amount of red tape. I would think that probably within your space it's, it's probably been reduced a little. But is it, do you feel that, I mean, as you mentioned, you're bringing a completely different lens to that business, which is great, and they, they definitely need that, and I think it's great, great that they've done that. But have you been able to take those resources and really deploy them to where you think they, they are going to have the most impact? Is that probably where your strength is in that role? Yeah, I think it's quite diverse. I think being able to make sure that we're negotiating win-win upsides and that we're able to sort of push things along at the right pace um, is definitely something that, that's super helpful. 
I mean, resources are constrained in most organisations at the moment. I yep. think, you know, everyone across every industry is feeling the pressure and consulting, you know, I think it's been well documented, is, is no different. Yep. We're not a client-facing division. Uh, but it... Um, it definitely has been a very interesting experience. I mean, KPMG, like many big organisations, is full of incredibly smart people yeah. and people with deep domain expertise. It's far less corporate than I would have assumed, at least in the part of the business that I work in. And it's incredibly flexible. You know, I've got three young kids. And so, you know, from that perspective, you know, very respectful culture, great relationships internally and yep. excellent to have the opportunity to work with really smart people. It has red tape, but, it, but the, you know, I think that's typical of all Absolutely. organizations. And I think there is a really strong push towards continuing to innovate, both within futures. And I think there's a broad acknowledgement of the need for that more widely across the firm as well. So I want to touch on what you've so one of the things you mentioned there, three small children. So the startup life that most people typically don't see is, you know, it's 400 hours a week and so forth, you know, which is not really that, that like that. I guess what people don't always understand is that as a startup founder, you do have complete control of your day to a degree. Yeah. And you might be working slightly longer hours than everybody else, but you can put them in wherever you want. Um, moving to a corporate, have you found that that has changed your life, your routine, how you sort of live your day? Is it is it a little bit more... I guess, plan rather than so reactive and, and, you know, jumping on things because they've happened and you didn't know they happened is, is a little bit more structured. And does that enable you to give yourself a little bit more balance in your eyes or I'm interested to know? I don't know if I'm the personality type that necessarily <laughs> fully embraces the, um, fully embraces the, the concept of balance. I mean, I think, I, I think I believe in balance as, you know, it's, it's, you have to give more to one part of your life at certain points and then sometimes the pendulum swings. But I don't think, I mean, yep. you've got kids as well and have run businesses and have all sorts of side projects. So you know as well as anyone that sometimes the the, the balance, you know, is not quite um, even. But you, it, It's it'll, not really balanced. Yeah. It's a, but it's yeah. never actually even, no. Yeah. I have great flexibility in my role at KPMG. Yep. I work a lot from home, which mm -hmm. enables me to be there for my kids some afternoons and, you know, do some, you know, be there with them um, and then I'm back online in the evening. Yep. So I think it's probably relatively, you know, similar in some ways. Obviously, the types of work are quite different, but because we're working with startups anyway and the pace that they're moving True. at is, is fast, um, oftentimes we, you know, we'll commit to doing something and we'd have to execute quickly. So I think there are parallels. Obviously, yeah. the organisation and the structure is is different to working in a in an early stage startup. But it, I still, uh, I don't think my desire to execute at pace has changed because I'm working <laughs> in a large org. Now, you just mentioned your personality type. So there's a couple of things I want to jump on here. And, and you also mentioned side projects and we'll come to that in a sec. But yeah. you told me, I can't remember when it was, not that long ago, yeah. about a daily habit that you have, which yeah. for someone with your personality type who is working and has small children, um, is hard to do something consistently. And you've been doing something consistently for a ridiculous amount of time. <laughs> and I can't actually remember the number, but talk about it because I, I'm so in awe of this, you know, I, having trained and done an exercise training last year for, for a big event, which you know about, and I find that quite difficult and I managed to do it, which was great. And then you went and just dropped in what you did. It just made me feel so insignificant. So tell us what, what it is again, because I just find it amazing. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I mean, I know how committed you are to your exercise as well. So I think you have a daily practice there as well. Uh, I definitely wouldn't undersell that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so actually, I mean, I've been running for a long time, but I'm after I finished up at Remote Social, I think probably as part of that, I thought I need something you know, another goal to focus something on, to hang on to. something to hang on to as I navigated that change. And I made a decision to get, I had had some time off for injuries, but I'd built up to a point that I felt confident running again, you know, fairly frequently. And I thought, I'm going to set myself a goal of running every day, at least 5Ks for at least 30 days. Yep. Um, I smashed through the 30 days and decided to keep going and someone asked me um, in front of a few other people, how long are you going to go for? And it just came out, I'm going to run every day without having a day off, at least 5Ks for a full year. 
um, so I got to a year. Yep. And I was like, oh, oh I'm not going to stop now. So <laughs> at the beginning of July, I passed through two years. So I'm up to sort of 760 days ish of running every day. And it's been, um, some people have said to me, how many days out of those 760 days have you thought, I, I don't feel like running? That was my next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say 760 days. Oh, wow. There's 760 days, there's been part of me that said like, oh, no one's imposing this upon you. You don't have to do it. Just, you know, it's okay to have a day off. No one will know. But that kind of defeats the point. It's become... And I won't be able to do it forever because I want to start training for some much longer races. And yep. when you're starting to talk about training for anything over 50 k's, you really need to give so yourself a couple of days. So we're talking about much longer up. races because 50 k's is a long way. Yes, yeah, so I've done a few 50 k's within. So it's not. It hasn't. It's been at least five k's every day. But there have been plenty of. It's now. It's probably more like between five and ten every day. There yep. would be a lot of days where I do. So it's about 10 40 minutes a day. roughly. Is that what you're sort of running typically? Yeah, sometimes longer. So I've got a group that I run with some mornings. We have to get up at 4:30, which is the only downside of running That's with the downside, them. Particularly in this weather yeah. right now, it's freezing. But they'll typically do you know 12 to 14 k's of a normal morning. And then we'll grab a coffee. But if, if you're talking about wanting to run anything over about, for me, anything over about 80 k's a week, you really have to have a day off. Otherwise, yeah. you're you're just your body doesn't handle it. My body doing doesn't that. handle it as well. It was awful. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I did though. I was doing those when I was training before. I did those all that running for yeah. six months, and I found it brutal. Yeah. Um, and you, if you you'll get injured if you don't. But um, yeah. I mean, five k's is still a, it's still a fair way. We did nudge. We did a charity thing where we ran for thirty one days for a month yeah. every day, and we I think it was an average of like three to four. And I actually found that quite tough, just because yeah. timing. Just some days, I just didn't you know I just didn't want to do it, or I was maybe I'd been out to a party, maybe I was yeah. just tired, maybe the kids had something early. It's hard, and I think even my training for my event, I missed. I think I missed four or five days out of the six months where I didn't do yeah. the training I was supposed to. I always did something, but I perhaps didn't fulfill the whole half marathon or whatever it yeah. is I was supposed to be doing that time. But for you haven't missed a day. I find that just incredible. Um, yeah. How, I mean, that just shows your mental capability to be able to do that. Do you find it, I know there are days where you don't want to do it, but do you find it hard to overcome that? Um, I, I just have made a commitment to myself. And so sometimes I will get up and I'll get up at 4.30 and I'll do it if I know I've got a busy day or if yep. I'm meeting someone. Rarely do I do it in the middle of the day, yep. but certainly if I haven't done it by, you know, sometimes I'm running in the dark, sometimes I'm running. I've never run at 10 to midnight, but I have <laughs> run in, I have had some crazy, you know, I've run through illnesses I, this morning, I actually ran. I did a pretty nasty injury running on Bondi yesterday. Um, so uh, this morning, I ran with a nasty injury on did my. Did you run foot. on the beach? I was yesterday. I don't normally. Did you cut your foot? I just um, I had no shoes and I clipped a rock and I thought I took off two toes. It's amazing how much it takes to skin off that. <laughs> yeah, stuff. but anyway, so I've just I just commit to getting it done, and it's just a mindset thing. I will just not allow myself to not do it. Um, I'm so impressed. Yeah. With it. I mean, just over, you know, two years. I mean, that's a long time. I know it goes quick, but yeah. to do that, what about holidays and Christmas and like just that's I think what gets me. It's it's not that you've been running for two years. A lot of people run regularly, but yeah. to not miss a day for that length of time with everything that's happening into your life, all yeah. your children's birthdays, all your holidays, all the school things, all the work things. That's just astounding. It's a well-oiled machine with the, um, with, the with the scheduling. <laughs> so it's yeah, it's a well-oiled machine, and yeah, I mean, it's been great. Running has taken me. You know, I've seen some fantastic places on holidays that I might otherwise not have seen. Met some amazing people that I might not otherwise have met, and so I think I just choose to. Even though probably there have been seven hundred and sixty days when there's been a part of me that I have thought, <laughs> oh goodness, I just want to, I just want to have a sleep <laughs> in. It also. You know, I reflect on oftentimes I think about people who can't do it and yep. and really get myself in the mindset of what a privilege it is to um, be, 
able to do it, especially having had three babies and, and you know, just get out there and enjoy the fresh air. And you never regret going for a No, run. you don't. And you never I'm, regret it. I agree with you on holiday. I've done early runs on holiday before the rest of the family's got up around, you know, places like Nice and things. And, and it's just beautiful in the morning. Some yeah. of those. And you get to see parts of the city you can't see in the day because it's way too congested. There's no time. One of the kids doesn't want to go there or whatever it is. And it's, yeah. it's really beautiful. Have you read the book, The Gap and the Game? I have not. You should read this book because it, it, it is talking exactly about what you just said there, where the way you frame things up is really the way you feel. And if you look at it as a privilege to run as opposed to a pain, you're going to enjoy it much more and so yeah. forth. Anyway, read it. It's an amazing book. Yeah. Um, I recommend it to anyone. Yeah, will do. It's, um, it's, I only just finished it. And I okay. just highly recommend it. So let's go back to, back to work. Yep. So you have another side project that you're doing as well because you're running and you're working and your children and you're yeah. I know. I'm just going to throw one more thing in. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think I was – so it, the project is called Capital X. It's not a business. It's yep. a – I would say it's a community project. and ecosystem project that has come out of my experience as a female founder raising capital at the time, it was almost impossible to find female angels Experience. to invest on. And, you know, obviously the number of, I think there is a concerted push within VC firms now to get more women into the partnerships. And certainly there's a broad acknowledgement that we need more of that, more gender representation at the investment committee mm -hmm. level and, and at the partner level. Um, but you know, it's really stayed with me and I think there it, it doesn't seem to be getting much better. It's sort of the, the numbers tick up and then they tick back down again. But, you know, globally I think it's still around, you know, depending on which report you read, it's still around 2% that go to all female founding teams. And It's you know, shocking. I've, yeah, it is shocking. I read it every week and, yeah. and you're right. I read article after article, post after post about female founders this, female founders that, we're doing this, we're doing that, everyone's changing, the world's changing, everything's going to be great. And then every week you read the report on the funding and where it went and it's always the same. It's yeah. sitting around bugger all. And it will uptick because of one particular deal where, uh, you know, the, the small number of deals where there are female founders that, you know, raise a big round, you know, that can change the percentages of, yep. you know, a little bit here and there. Um, certainly, I think in early stage in Australia, we are seeing at least more mixed gender founding teams um, getting funded. The numbers for all female founding teams is still really bad. And I, after I left remote social, um, I don't have huge amounts of capital to, to deploy, but certainly becoming a little bit more active in, in angel investing is something that I'm quite keen to do. I did the Start Make First Believers yep. program um, and uh, I'd love to do more if I had more capital but have over the last few years made a few investments into female-founded businesses and will do more in the future. But beyond that, also wanted to see how can – I continue to build, you know, within the startup ecosystem on the network that I have and the resources that I have and the way I think about things. And um, I started a, a, probably sounds a bit strange, but started a spreadsheet on LinkedIn last year yep. that got lots of traction and have spent a couple of months thinking about what is the right format for this to take in order to really leverage um, what, you know, the beginnings of something um, and Put a, quite a bit of pressure on myself to you know, think, you know, what are the answers? What can this be the answer to? And I think where I've landed with that is creating a place where female founders um, can get visibility, be found yep. by investors and find other female investors to talk to, whether they be angels or partners at funds or earlier stage at funds. Just create a place where those women can be more visible I will say I don't think it's only for women to solve the problem of the gender imbalance in funding and I've had great conversations with a number of funds including a few of the big ones mm -hmm. to of how they can get involved and I know there's certainly lots of male investors who are looking at the early version of that list so it's about getting more visibility for women in the ecosystem but with the intention that it be leveraged um, by all everyone across the ecosystem yep. from you know media outlets to um, event organisers, obviously, in addition to investors, and have been having great conversations about how we can continue some of that work. I think it is already the most comprehensive list of female founders and investors in the country. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we should 
We should talk more about that after because I've got an idea about that. But um, we, if this topic comes up on this show every two weeks. Yeah. And has been for two years. Yeah. And nothing's changed. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I, I find it incredibly frustrating. In fact, I just don't understand why there can be so much talk and then so little action about it. But um, at least you're trying to do something that's good. And if people want to find out about that list or see that list, how can they find it? How can they... Well, I think we can put the website in the show notes or they can connect with me on LinkedIn. It's Jessica Baird Walsh on LinkedIn and the website is capital X. It's it's a it's capital dash x dot co the dot com was taken but we'll put I was the, about to ask yeah. you, did you get the dot com that <laughs> but we'll been um crazy. we'll put the we can put the link in the show notes so people can access it otherwise it will be accessed by my linkedin yeah we'll, we'll definitely put that in the, yeah. in the show link yeah um and so i guess what's next you know you've you've got your running you've got your side projects you've got your corporate career yeah. Where where do you see yourself going? Are you just really enjoying being in this place, doing all these things at the moment? Yeah, I definitely love variety. I'm starting to think a lot about um, the changing nature of the way we work, and I think there are some through lines there with remote social and and you know deeply thinking about the way we work. Obviously, technology is changing that a lot, and I'm really interested in some of the trends around. AI and automation and how that's changing mm. the way we work. Think what you could have work. done with remote social with AI now. When you look back on it, gosh, you could have. I love that business. You could have, you could do some amazing things with that now. Yeah. Well, Mike's still going. So um, so yeah. I mean, and hopefully he's um, hopefully he's progressing. Lots of interesting things. He's definitely got great vision for product and so yeah. forth. So I'm sure he's thinking a lot about that. But yeah, I mean, it's it's so interesting the way we're changing as a you know, as a society, thinking Quickly. lots about, you know, have been spending lots of time with great AI founders working in the area of agents and thinking about how that changes the way we work. And and so, yeah, I mean, I'm really grateful, obviously love having the side projects and the other things to focus on as well, doing some advisory and um, mentoring some earlier stage businesses, yeah. but also loving having the opportunity to work with founders from across a really diverse set of technology and use cases and problems that they're solving. Yeah. I mean, I've been working with space tech companies and thinking about geospatial data and how that applies across industries in Australia. And those are experiences I don't think I would have had in any of the other careers that no. I've had to date. And so, yeah, I'm super grateful for this next stage and it's very open to what happens next as I continue to grow and continue to, to push. I think it's great that you've got access to that because you were right, if you're running around startup, you don't have access to anything but your own world really and whoever's very close to it but to see all those different innovative things at a period of massive change right we're yeah. going into a period of massive massive change and I think to also you've got access to data right KPMG have access to data about the yeah. things that are changing in the worlds they're changing so that would be super super interesting yeah I do I think my heart is definitely you know working with the founders is it's it's so gratifying having the opportunity to work with these incredibly smart founders building real game-changing inventions and platforms and then and thinking about how can we support them to apply that across new industries or new client types. I think that definitely speaks to my early stage DNA and, <laughs> and how we can kind of cross the bridge. I love the early stage DNA. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks and for having it's me. so, gosh, not a conversation I would have imagined having when I met you two, three years ago. And who knows when we get you back on the third time where you'll be or what you'll be doing um, and if you'll still be running. But thank yeah. you so much for coming on. I hope you are. I really do. I'm still blown away by that. Um, I want to do some longer races. So I will have to probably give up running. if I, I'm going to probably start training at some point. What sort of length are we talking? 100Ks. It's such a long way. It's a long way, yeah. And really, if you're going to run 40Ks on a Saturday and 20Ks on a Sunday, your body wants a rest on Monday. So I don't think you can train for those events meaningfully without um, having a day off. So no. I think it's, it'll, it's, it'll be a very difficult day for me when I decide to <laughs> finally have a day off. But I think it'll be a question of like everything in life, you choose to stop doing one thing so that you can choose else. to embrace doing something else. And, um, so when that day comes, that's how I'll try to think about maybe it. Maybe we'll maybe we'll get maybe we'll get a film crew to follow you. Yeah. We'll do the whole hundred Ks right there. We'll be asking I'll be there yeah. asking you questions yeah. all the way, but I'll be on Skeeter. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Sounds like fun. Awesome. Well look, thank you again. Thanks, and Steve. I look forward to seeing what's next with you. Yeah, great to see you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for watching today. What an interesting journey Jess is on. Um, we'll look forward to seeing where she goes. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you next week.